Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a friend who's come to visit and show us some magical things. Brandon Allinger from Prop Store. How are you, sir? I'm good, thanks for having me out today. Oh, and I'm always happy when you come because you bring amazing things that I feel like really lucky to get to see. Prop Store has a tremendous auction coming up later this month. Yeah, it's coming up soon actually, November 9th, 10th, and 11th. Um, this is the catalog, which is also online, am I right? It is, yep. There are some incredible things in here, uh, which if you're interested, you should bid on. And if you're just a prop replicator, also Prop Store's pictures are always reliably complete. I'd love your photo archives, um, but you have brought something special in here. Yeah, I mean, this auction, this is one of our EMLA auctions, or Entertainment Memorabilia Live auctions. So this is, I would say, the signature event where the best items that we've found all year live. And we do one a year in LA, one a year in London. This is the London auction, and we have found some really good things here. You know, for us, we're all fans and collectors ourselves, so we love having things come in the door that we haven't seen before. Yeah. And this is a, a fresh to market piece for us. This we have not seen or handled before. And this is an original Weems robot mm. built by Industrial Light and Magic for batteries not included. Oh my God. So now, I can just safely put oh, it up there. Wow. Oh, it's a little puppetable. Yes. <gasps> yeah, those are actually puppeteering rods. And I think the wire is just to sort of keep them from, from spreading apart from each other to kind of hold them in place. Well, it looks like that's also where it gets power for the lighting. Oh, maybe that's if it. There yeah. Is, okay. Um, yeah, which there is a little switch right there. Oh my God. Look at that. Yeah. Um, a little micro switch. I might have seen this. Or one, I saw one of these robots at the California State Fair in 1993 or four. Oh, really? There what, were some. There ILM were some display. Or? Yeah, ILM okay. had their own custom display there, and there were a couple of batteries not included robots. And it was that was the very first time I ever saw a piece that had been made for a movie right up close. And I remember being like, "Wow, it's it's a little. It's not shitty, but it's." It's way less precise than you rough imagine. Rough around the edges. Yeah, right? rough around the yeah, edges. Yeah. No, and a lot of again, character. So much character. This is an amazing, amazing piece. What else did they have at that exhibit? Just all kinds of different ILM models? Yeah, and uh, these are the ones I really specifically remember mm -hmm. because I remember feeling like I could see the maker's hand in them. And so that's mm -hmm. the only thing I remember. It's like it took over my whole brain. Yeah, yeah. But I love like the aliens here like cobbled their stuff together out of stuff they found on Earth, right? right? Yeah, and it's, I mean, they call them the fix-it robots in the movie, and there's at least three different main characters, and I think there's the parents, the bigger ships as well. Yes. Um, the Ma and Pa robots. And I know Ralph McQuarrie had a hand in designing these. He did a bunch of sketches for them, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and we actually, I think we have another lot in the auction, which I don't have here today, but it's actually a 3D model, a prototype that Ralph built, which is cool because he didn't build a lot of models. You know, most wow. of his stuff is 2D, but he, for whatever reason on this project, he built some models. I think he liked building models and sort of always wanted to inch into that world. Oh, and so I I'm wish sure I had known a, that. Yeah. <laughs> I had gone over to his house and built some models. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but it's a great, it's a great classic design. Everything that came out of that 1980s era at ILM is kind of gold, and um, I think this is is no exception. You know, regardless of what you may think of the film, especially yeah. 35 later, 35 years later, the robots, the puppets, everything to do with the visual effects is fantastic. For such a delicate piece, I mean, I can see that there might have been an antenna here that's mm -hmm. missing, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly complete for how delicate it is. Yeah, that's right, because you do still have a couple baby antennas on the back and yeah. the sides here. And it's, those puppeteering rods, I, do, I think the electronics are untested. I don't think we've opened it up. Yeah. But theoretically, there are some remnants of 1980s, you know, grain of wheat bulbs or whatever it may be. Exactly. Take a look, see what you can uncover. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, these little tiny 080 screws. There's one here and there's one there. And that's probably how you pull the whole carapace off. Yeah. Um, I would do that if you hired me to restore it, but I won't do it now. <laughs> well, it probably hasn't been open since 86 or whatever it was, you know, yeah. so. But it's a, it's a great little piece and, you know, it's interesting. We talk a lot about, we talk a lot with collectors about what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that comes up frequently is people want something that's easy to display, right? right? And it's like, a lot of stuff is great. Like you got Han and Carbonite up there on your wall, but it's huge. That, like is, you, that is an impossible piece yeah, to display. If you don't have a warehouse, it's yeah. a very, very challenging thing to display. Whereas something like this, you can almost put it anywhere. It's like, yeah. it'll go on your desk, it'll go on your bookshelf. It's kind of that perfect size, you know, that certain props fall mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. where it just really works from a display 
aesthetic perspective. I, I noticed you guys also put a lot of energy into uh, the singular display of the, of the mm -hmm. objects that mm -hmm. you auction off so that people can bring it home and do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of all about taking it from what it was as a production asset into what it is now as sort of a holy relic of cinema. You know? well, and specifically as a holy relic, as a, as a bit of like religious iconography of American culture, it is, again, this is a, rem I'm so grateful this has been so well cared for mm -hmm. over the intervening 35 years because it's, again, it's really rare to see something this delicate where so much is still perfectly extant on it. Right, and they could have easily been thrown thrown out. You know, I've, I actually heard stories that in the 80s, some of these wound up in just prop rental houses. I don't know if it was Sony or another studio, but you know, they were just a little robot, so they just put them on the on yeah. the shelves. I know some of them were preserved by ILM model makers. That may be where this one came from. I don't know the exact lineage. I know this has been consigned in by a collector who's had it for a number of years. Um, but we've handled a couple others in the past. The construction's absolutely consistent. The paint work, the, the level of detailing and, and the finish. And yeah, just, just a great little piece, uh, a great little example of ILM's work. Also, uh, all of the lettering on here is clearly done using uh, dry transfer rub down lettering, mm. which is how we did everything back in the day. We didn't do decals as much because there was always, it was harder to cover over a, the, the edges of a decal. But this rub down here, it says industrial. You can just see the letters have kind of moved over uh -huh. the years. Yeah. That's a classic tell of rub down lettering. I miss rub down lettering. I like. You used to be able to order it for models, and like you're saying, it's a cleaner look than a decal. It is a cleaner look than a decal, and you yeah. can also you used to be able to do it with nice opaque, bright white colors, which is mm -hmm. much harder with a decal. So, uh, a, it, yeah, it's a shame that that process is mostly gone as a as a purchasable thing. As you're saying that, I'm wondering if there's any Easter eggs hidden in there. You know, model maker initials, or oh yeah, I mean, this says industrial. Is that for industrial light and magic? Oh, or could that... be right. Yeah, out of reach. Contents under pressure. Contents under pressure, non-toxic. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Or maybe that's just what was on the sheet. <laughs> yeah, and then this is like, this is almost like one of those sort of maker's marks. Oh uh, yeah. Right? Like yeah. A, yeah. Um, I put a Easter egg on the space shuttle for Space Cowboys. Okay. I uh, was making all the stuff for the interior of the payload bay, and at one point I made a, I just made a coffee maker. I made like a Mr. Coffee with a gold coffee pot and a, like a white Tyvek. And I hid it in this place. I thought it would never be seen. It ended up in this hero shot and I got some crap for it. Oh, well, that's kind of cool though. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question. When you were making models, did you sign your models? Like um, at ILM, we did. Mm -hmm. There was actually, it was, it's a, a healthy tradition. You can see it on the, um, in the Smithsonian's collection where they've got the mothership from ET. Mm -hmm. The model mm -hmm. makers all signed it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the same with a lot of the Star Wars encounters. ships. Close uh, the encounters. Close Encounters, yeah. right. Yeah. The Greg Jean crew. The mothership from E.T. came through ILM when we were doing the restoration for Boy. It was uh, called Boy's Life okay. when Spielberg was doing the restoration. Yeah. And that model, the paint job had deteriorated and I think they hired the original model maker, it might have been Mike Fulmer, to come in and repaint because it was all like this rubbed graphite mm, okay. and silver. Yeah. But, Specifically, there's a spot under the carapace where everyone had signed oh, that's it. Cool. So it was yeah. that felt like being part yeah. of a great tradition. Yeah. At the end of the, we did uh, Podme's apartment, Fawn Davis and I. Okay. And we definitely signed some of the interior you parts. You have of to, it. right? Yeah, of course. If somebody's looking at it in 30 years, you want to, yeah, you got to be in there. Um, on some of the ILM ships, the signatures are more visible than you would think. <laughs> there are right. places where if you brought the camera really close, you'd be able to see Lauren Peterson's name. Yeah, which probably no one was doing in 1976. <laughs> but today, it's like, it's up there. That's an interesting story about the ET ship too. I never realized that was a restored model because I got to see it once in the conference room at Amblin, um, but I didn't realize I was looking at a restored piece. It's and it was just the paint job. Like the yeah. piece was in pretty good shape, but the paint job was. It's one of those um, when you do those hand rubbed finishes, anyone touches it, it just comes right up. Absolutely, yeah. it's just yeah. it's, it destroys it. Yeah. So. You know, uh, it's, it's something collectors always debate about. It's like, should I restore it or do I leave it in the original condition? Obviously, if you restore it, the aesthetic comes up, it's more presentable, et cetera. But have you taken away a little bit of that originality? I think filmmakers err towards, let's make it look like it should look. Yeah. Collectors and fans maybe err more towards, leave it historic. You know, you know? It's, so it's, I don't know. It's, I, it's, I'm it's more in the realm of doing restoration, but hiring someone who really cares about it. Like my friend John Goodson, who you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. just spent, a couple of years restoring the Orion spaceship from 2001. Right. And 
like absolutely that thing was in pretty great shape, but you totally needed to give it to someone like John Goodson mm -hmm. to like let it live out the next 100 years of its existence. Right, right. Because restoration is also about stopping the deterioration. Right, conservation, preservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he probably, just being the obsessive model maker type, he probably went to extreme lengths to make sure everything that was being put back was exactly as it should be. So, oh yeah, no, yeah. John is the deepest geek when it comes to this. He built a Razor Quest for, for Razor Crest, all of the Razor Crest models for the Mandalorian, and I worked with him at ILM, and like, he's preternaturally fast with styrene. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what that mm -hmm. guy can do. And so because he like has paid deep attention, I feel like you would give him any model, and he'd be able to like make it look exactly like it should, but mm -hmm. last. Right. Yeah, and that's more. I, I feel like that's where I would. Yeah, I mean, I think especially if there are elements that are missing, then mm -hmm. it's like you kind of want to see those. You know, it feels incomplete without them. So that makes sense. And it, it's, uh, I think it's you know, restoration is really its own world and its own art. And <laughs> sometimes people think like, ah, oh, you'll just restore it, like you you know, paint a car in three days. And it's like, no, 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 the restoration work could take six, 12 months, right? Well, it could be a massive absolutely. project, depending well, what you're doing. This begs the question, when you guys have stuff restored, do you make that part of the provenance and the record of the we piece? We do, yeah, yeah. We, try, we try to. You know, we, we did a very public restoration project on the Nostromo model, which mm -hmm, you're familiar mm -hmm. with. Oh, and I loved how- Graham McCune designed it. Open and and we try to document that and really show what we were doing. And even there, we didn't get everything perfect, and some detractors <laughs> said like, ah, oh, that shouldn't be there. And so you could probably go in and say like, actually, we're now gonna go a level beyond what Prop Store did on this one. You know, there's, there's all these different levels that you could hit with how accurate, how obsessive, how fanatic you're trying to be with it. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to capture that and capture the history of the piece. And it's, it's you know, it becomes part of the story of the object. And, you know, you know it's, and it's, it actually makes you appreciate that much more how, how rare it is to see models and things that are in their original condition. Because, like, we talked about the Batwing, yeah. unfortunately, was fully repainted, and there's nothing anyone can do about that. That's what history did to it. So all you can really do is improve on prior restoration yeah. work. But if it's in its unrestored condition, then I think, you know, there's a there's a sort of a bigger argument for leaving it exactly as it is. And, again, sense. when you look at a piece like this up close, you see so much of the hand of the maker. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite thrilling. Mm -hmm. Like, there is something that, you know, you see it in the movie and you put it in one part of your brain and then you look at it up close and it ends up in this whole other aesthetic, mechanical, uh, problem-solving part. And I just... I. I never, obviously, I love looking at original props up close, but I really feel like if you were able to see this up close, you'd have a really similar experience. Like, wow, look at that. Someone built that for a movie and took it on set and puppeted this little guy. And it's actually kind of impressive that it's as small as it is. You would yeah. almost think they would go larger just to have more room to work with it with your hands, right? Yeah, they like working small, though, too. I, guess I mean, so. ILM built an actual head size replica of the alien from. Uh, uh, Men in Black. Oh, right, right. Inside yeah. the, I mean, I they built a full, a face. big one. Yeah. But they also built one that was just the size of the guy's head. Yeah. You know, they... They love the detail. It's a right. challenge, I guess. Of it's course. Absolutely. Yeah. Dude, what a great piece. I never thought I'd get to see these guys again. Well, I'm glad you got to see it. It's always fun <laughs> showing it to a model maker like yourself who really oh. appreciates the craft that's gone into it. Ah, oh, man. It is gorgeous. Thank you, Brandon.